OK, we're going to get this started because whatever, it's a long meeting today. Um, the agenda for tonight, past and future events as usual are at the beginning now. We're going to talk about some new EVs. It's going to be the mic show, by the way. Uh, Sam will be a nice intermission and then it's back to me again for the whole thing. Um, charging on in Merbs is what Sam's been talking about. Uh, planning a road trip is what I'm going to talk about again in the news and then a round table and we will get things going. Okay, past events. Uh, kilowatts and coffee, we only did one this month, really, because um, we were busy doing stuff, so cool. Um, we did the uh, Salon de Véhicule Electrique with that wave booth plus static display. I said that all the fun. Um, so that was good. That was a fun weekend. I was sick the second day because talking to the public makes you ill. Thanks to the volunteers, though. Yes, thank you, volunteers, for that. That was great. That was fun. Also, thank you to people who helped out at EarthFest in Carlton Place. That was cold. Success, though. It was a success. Great success. Cold. I bought some hot sauce from the people behind us. Um, that was good. Coffee House. That was me and a handful of others. Uh, Mitchell was there. Carl was there. Um, so I did a presentation on Saturday. And that went well. Lots of good questions. Yada, yada, yada. Good stuff. Upcoming events. So we have our next meeting next month. Uh, Kilowatts and Coffee is uh, basically every weekend. Uh, so I started spreading them out around the city. So we've got Orleans, Barhaven, Ottawa, Stittsville. There you go. Uh, Kempville, this is uh, this Sunday coming up. North Granville Sustainability Fair. We did this for the past few years. Um, so it's really fun. Usually free admission, free lunch. For each car comes EV. So if you're test driving or static display, you get a car or not a car. <laughs> if you have a car, you get a lunch. Um, there you go. Uh, May 29th, there's a Patagonia event. This is more for me and Raymond and maybe a couple other people. Um, they just want to show off a movie and we're going to be there to answer some questions. Literally across the street. Just is it not? Pub 101. Is it really? Yeah. Good to know because I had no idea where it was. Yeah. I'd have to Google it the day of. Um, Blackburn Fun Fair. I will be camping that weekend with the scouts, so you guys are on your own. Good luck. Um, it's always fun. That's a fun event. Yeah. Hopefully, Raymond doesn't drag you to more ABBA stuff. Um, there was the ABBA stuff last year? There yeah. were a couple of years ago. There was, yeah, it was, it was he was really excited about oh, it. The, the, the concert was yeah, ABBA. Yeah. yeah, it was terrible. Um, <laughs> Climate Network Lanark. There we go. Okay. Westport Car Show, July 20th. Um, Yep, more to follow on that. Carp Fair in the fall, details to come. Uh, SmartNet Coalition, tentatively October 5th. They didn't get lands down, so I don't know what the plan is this year. We're still working on that. We should update that picture from, we really should. from at least two years ago. Yep, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's COVID times because they had that uh, de uh, decontamination tent. Yeah, they had Ryan's car. And Ryan's car. So 2019. Yeah, get that Mitsu out of there. Okay. Looking forward to 2024. So this presentation came about because uh, Raymond made a comment last month about how there weren't any good EVs coming out this year. And I was like, that can't be right. Uh, so it turns out it's not. There's a whole bunch. Um, so we've got 32 new cars coming out at least. Uh, 44 new models will be here by 2027, so in a couple of years, which is weird to think about that it's only a few years away. Uh, many EVs will be from brands that don't have EVs currently, which is cool. Um, including Dodge, Fiat, Honda, Jeep, Lincoln, and Ram. All right, so we'll start with giant SUVs this year. So the Escalade IQ uh, is a behemoth. The specs are on there. So that's coming out this year. The Cadillac Optic. Cadillac has a thing going with ick. Um, so that's fun. Um, Chevy Blazer EV is already out. Uh, we had one for test drives in... Carlton Place. Carlton Place. It really only takes a hundred pounds towing. Yes. It's terrible. Well, you know, it's it's a Chevy. It was so. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I don't have to tell you, it's a Chevy. Chevy because the frame, the way they built it with lighter components, or yeah, sure, but let's figure it out. <laughs> it's fine. So it's 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 there. Um, we've got the Equinox coming out, which will be one of the more affordable ones, although they nixed the cheapest one. The uh, Ford Explorer apparently was just canceled, or not just canceled, but delayed because Ford is being stupid. Um, so it's gonna—it was supposed to be a big three-row SUV built in Oshawa, I think Oshawa, 
wherever their assembly plant is. Um, but so Oakville starts with an O, and it's all Toronto to me. It says it Oakville, I didn't put that on the slide. <laughs> anyway, so it's going to be coming um, probably next year, maybe the year after, but it was supposed to be this year. So that's sad, but anyway. Um, Honda's new Prologue, uh, which is not the same as the Prelude, because that was also a Honda car. The Prologue is built, it's a Blazer in disguise, uh, complete with uh, OnStar from Chevy. So that's fun, um, but it has Apple CarPlay. So if you like the, the Chevy Blazer, but you want Apple CarPlay, then you get the Prologue. Um, Ionic 9, which used to be the Ionic 7, uh, that's gonna be announced in June, uh, so a couple of months. It's gonna be the same size as the Palisade, and it's, you know, EJP, so it'll be good. Um, Jeep Recon is supposed to be revealed this fall. Uh, so that's their Jeep thing. Uh, Wagoneer S is coming out also in the fall. So that'll be a very expensive Grand Cherokee type thing. Well, it's a Wagoneer. Fully V or? Fully V, it's both fully Vs. Jeep's first off-road SUV. Yep. Yeah. Uh, electric SUV, did I not put electric in there? No, they didn't. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, it's just like that. Jeep's first an electric off -road. First I mean, electric was given, no one else cares about their gas ones. Because they have hybrids right now. Yeah, whatever, but yeah. nobody cares about them, so we want the electric. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, he had a Wrangler selling here. Yeah, so they're everywhere. They're, yeah. Everywhere. they're one of their best-selling Wranglers. Mm -hmm. um, Lucid Gravity is coming out. Um, Lincoln Star is a car that's apparently a thing. So that's yeah. basically the Ford Explorer electric. Like, yeah, so that's probably delayed as well because it's the Explorer, but Lincoln, so it's more expensive. It's a fancy Explorer. But the fancy pants, you've got the EQG or the G-Wagon, um, which that's what it looks like. They just revealed it this week. So there you go. Um, so if you're looking for a hundred thousand dollar 1970s vintage car that's new, that's electric, there you go. Uh, it'll be competing with the Hummer, sort of. Um, Polestar Three is on its way. It's already out, I think, in some markets. Um, and I think that's the one with no tail window, right? With no back window. Was that the four? That's the four. So the three is their their hatchback, right? Okay. Uh, we've got some uh, Porsche, the Macan EVs coming. Uh, the VinFast VF9 has already been, we were talking about that a couple times, but that's supposed to arrive this year. Uh, we've got the Volvo EX90 um, and the EV9. EX90 was actually first uh, displayed at the Gatineau yeah. Show. There you go. It was at the Gatineau Show. Prototype. It was a prototype that was trailered in, and uh, yeah. it was the first show it was at. So there you go. So now it's coming. ev 9s already delivering. Somebody near me bought one, and... I saw it and I stopped and I was like, hey, nice car. And he's like, yours too. And I'm like, when'd you get it? And he's like, yesterday. So, <laughs> so there's a new EV in the, in the neighborhood for us. It's EV9. So that's cool. Uh, Sierra pickup truck, the 1500 Rev pickup truck. So the big pickups are coming this year. Is the Sierra the same platform as the Silverado? Yes. Yeah. Just a, it's the same all the time. Yeah. It, yeah. It'd be awesome. Do they tell what kind of, Say what kind of batteries you're putting in the GMC, like what size of batteries? They're like 200 kilowatt hours. 230 or 220, something like that. That's why you're getting that range. Yeah, no, they, they basically did the American thing of just more power. They're getting like 240 uh, miles They're, range, totally. So, yeah, they, I mean, so they, they got like, there was uh, some YouTubers did it. Um, they ran in the uh, Silverado, and TFL trucks did it, and they got like real world 700 and something kilometer uh, in real world. Good uh, for them. So that was cool. Uh, there's a Silverado 724 is what they got out of it for reals. 10,000 pounds towing. Uh, Cybertruck is coming to Canada like, probably soon. Uh, so we all know about that. Don't be rusted. Yes. Yeah. Uh, only on the train. You can take the train, Rusty. Um, Fiat 500e, they had that at the Gatno show. Um, that was cool. Oh, yeah, was That's cool. the cheapest car you can buy right now. You do. Um, it costs basically the monthly payments are the same yeah. amount as a tank of gas a week. Uh, so there you go. So if you spend 70 bucks a week on gas, the car is basically free. Yeah, it was $69 a week. 69 bucks a week for that car. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and the range isn't terrible. Like you can get the pink yeah, on yeah, that. Uh, EX30. Coming out, that's Volvo's cheapest affordable option, but Volvo's not cheap. 
Uh, Mini has a couple, so the Aceman and the Countryman are both coming. These are new electrics. They already have the Countryman. The fully electric one? Yeah. Okay. I, I worried for one of them. There you go. All right. Well, they're, they've already arrived. So some of these have already arrived, which is great. Uh, the Vans, so we've got the ID Buzz coming. Uh, the Promaster's already out, apparently. Um, but the Buzz, long promised, finally being delivered this fall, hopefully. Again, I don't get it. Promaster, 264-kilometer range. Then the pickup truck, you're in the 5600, you know? Well, that's because the pickup has twice the size of the battery. I, I understand, but they don't... So 264 the times two. I, I, yes, but they don't offer it for, like, work oh, vans. Yeah. The mileage for work stupid. van is... Crap. Stupid, yeah. Yeah, across the board. It's not going to be installed. Yeah. But the, the, it's the only reason I don't have an electric van. Yeah, because of that. Mileage. Yeah, if they had something like a Ram. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But any... Like three fifty and up, I would know. Okay, well, absolutely. Yeah. Polestar four. There's the one with the no back window. Uh, so people complained that the Ionic five didn't have a windshield wiper. Well, they, <laughs> they, 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 they hell, hold my wiper fluid. Does it come with, with the wiper though? No. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, the ID seven is Volkswagen's luxury sedan. So that's cool. That's coming out. The muscle cars. So there's only one muscle car because that's not really a thing. Um, but the Dodge Charger Daytona, um, that comes in two and four door versions. So if you have kids or not, I guess. Did he say that the the Corvette was coming alive? Yes, the, it, I don't know when. Okay, yeah, it's been talked about. Um, this is replacing the Charger and the Challenger, um, which are both ICE vehicles. Um, they've got some crazy specs on there, but it's only 400 volt architecture, which I thought was a miss. But whatever, there's your Corvette. Electric Corvette, that's 2025, so that's next year. And the next gen Bolt, which will use LFP batteries, it'll be the first Ultium car with LFP. Uh, so that's coming out next year. Any uh, idea of price? Uh, it should be cheap, is the plan. I assume it'll be similar to the current Bolt price. 35 to 40 years start. Something in that ballpark, yeah. But it's also so, a small car. But it's, you know, well, we'll see. This is, um, these are just rumors, right? Fair enough. And then there's the Scout, possibly hauler. They, they copy wrote that name. So I'm thinking that the pickup's going to be the hauler, um, which is cool. And then this is 2026 or beyond, right? Uh, the Toyota Taco will be uh, revealed. They, they showed off a concept a few years ago. Um, new hybrid is coming out now, but apparently the EV option is coming out in two years. And who do you say on Scout? Scout is owned by Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Yeah. Um, and it's a body on frame. And then there's the Traveler, which is the one. That's my next car in 2027, probably. Or later. I forget. No, I'm not the Scout I don't want to screw that. Um, so the Traveler looks like it's going to be that. They haven't revealed it yet, so these are just guesses as to what it looks like. But it's based on the silhouette that they, revealed, they released. Uh, Rivian R2, which is really cool. Uh, so that's coming out as well in a couple of years. And then you've got the EV3 from Kia, which will be their most affordable Kia. So this will probably replace the Nero in 2026. Hmm? Kia needs a designer for their rims. Yeah. The EV9, the EV3, their rims are horrible. It's, it's a decision. It's a choice. And then the R3 and R3X, um, that is going to come take Subaru's lunch if they don't get their act together. Um, and then there's the Wrangler EV, so they're going to do the Recon and the Wrangler, um, but that'll be later, 2028. Hmm? I know, right? The back does look a bit like, I, that's what I said, it was a lot of, when I first saw it, I was like, it's a lot of, but uh, I think it looks cool, so whatever. All right, Sam, it's up to you. Do you want to do your own slides? Or you yeah, sure. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Take your seat. Keep it warm. So I, I put Raymond's name on there because he's got a, he, he built most of the slides together for other presentations and then I modified it for this one. So he's going to be with us today. Uh, just next or just a little side arrow. Yeah, there you there go. We go. So overview, I'm going to kind of go quick on the slides because this can be a long presentation that I'm going to try to shrink. Um, basically, you can see that no matter what we're going EV, I don't need to convince you guys. We're all aware of it. Um, the stats are all showing it across the board in every country. 
uh, and we can see that um, this is our uh, graph, and we can see that we're following that curve pretty dead on. We're a bit conservative, but we're really good. Mike, thanks. Good job. Thanks, man. Um, so basically, 90% of EV market share by 2030 in China. Um, EU is expected 80%. Uh, then we're expecting 70% by then. Then uh, what, what it means for Ottawa, basically that uh, 2040, we're going to have 90% of fleet. So basically what I'm trying to say is that we're going to have EVs no matter what people are saying. Uh, the, the numbers don't lie in this case, and it's showing that we're, we're being even more aggressive than we thought. Uh, so charging at home is the cheapest and easiest solution. Uh, it's easy when you have a house and it's your own panel and you just go in and do your own thing. When you live in MERPS, which is multi-unit residential um, building. buildings, uh, it can be a challenge because you have to convince a board, you have to convince your neighbors, uh, and you also have to have a plan because it's not just a one charger, you're now talking about a full infrastructure with multiple chargers. We're seeing more and more of a problem, and that's why a lot of condos don't have chargers uh, yet. Uh, they're starting to move. This year was uh, a big year for that, and uh, we'll see uh, why not. Uh, why uh, level one, two, and three chargers? I'm gonna just level one, 120 volt. Level two, 208, 240. Uh, you can get between three and 19 kilowatt. In Europe, you can actually go to 22 kilowatts. Um, 50 amp max if you're plugging in. Uh, you can go up to 80 amps uh, if you are doing a hardwire uh, installation uh, for residential. Then level three obviously is not a good fit uh, for condos or uh, MERPs, and we'll talk about it uh, a bit later. But we all know level three is really, it's like a gas station. It's weird to do this presentation here because you guys all know all the slides that I just <laughs> went through. So it's like preaching to the wrong people. But when we do those presentations, a lot of time people were giving information to people that know nothing about it. Um, so EV charging level one, level two, North America plug right now, the standard, uh, well, up to this year was the J1772. Uh, Tesla has its own adapter, uh, but you can, you can get adapters for the J1772. We are moving within the next two years to NAX, which is the uh, Tesla plug, the J3400. Um, there will be adapters for the cars that do have the J1772, so we don't have to worry about that. It's all, it's all in the works. Um, so the average commute for North American people is 42 kilometers a day. So a level one charger would take about five hours to charge that amount. A level two uh, chargers would take about one hour, give or take. Obviously, it depends on the charger and, and a lot of factors, the car and all that, but this is a good ballpark. So we have to focus on charging infrastructure when we come to condos. Like I was saying, it's not bad when you just go from the panel, put a plug, plug in the chargers, and away you go. But when you have 200 chargers, that can be a lot of an energy that you're requiring from the grid or from whatever uh, hydro service that comes to the building. And in most cases, it's going to be impossible to just charge like that unless it's planned from the start. Uh, we do see that a lot of condos are doing retrofits on lighting and AC. They're going with heat pumps and stuff like that. So they are saving a lot of energy. So we see a bit of a, a surplus we can use when we go and do the evaluation. But still, if we just go with a plug and a charger, it would be a very big challenge unless we're going with level one charging. Level one charging is, is a good start, but might not be the best scenario because we're, we're going to talk about... Sam, yeah, do you want questions at the end of the server? Go ahead. Okay. I, I know 30, 30 years ago, I bought a condo in the Hunt Club atrium. So yeah. the bank in Hunt Club, one with all the glass. I don't know if you folks are familiar with that. And they had block heaters that you could plug in because back right. in those days, they had block heaters. To me, like level one, 
I don't know if that would overwhelm with everybody. Too, too many people it's would, would done. Done. Well, well, what, what, what's the issue with people using that level one infrastructure if it's there like block heaters from 30, 40 years ago? So our first, um, actually when we do assessments, the first thing we see is if they do have those block heaters, uh, normally when it's an interior garage, they don't have them, but when, when it's open somewhat, yeah, they do room. have them. Yeah. So we do suggest to allow level one charging right away zero cost to the infrastructure and you can start charging because at the moment most condos they have two three maybe ten at the most electric vehicles uh people are moving towards it but they're afraid because they don't know about the charging infrastructure so the first recommendation we do is use those plugs but you've got to be careful uh, a block heater is rated for 500 uh, watts the electric EDSC will take 1200. So you can, the circuit will take that one car, but if it, if the circuit is shared between multiple parkings, most of the time it's two parking, they have the one plug with the two outlets yeah, yeah. and they share it. Yeah. So as long as you don't have two EVs, one beside the other, you're going to be fine. But we do the warning and we talk about it. it the, like two plugs. Yeah, the worst comes to worst, break your trips. Uh, and then, then you know you have a problem, and you evaluate, and you you find a solution. Obviously, it's a short term plan. It, it's just a band aid for now that we can figure things and actually have a plan for either level two or dedicated circuits. Sometimes you can reuse a conduit and just add a wire, and uh, and then you, you can have two uh, circuits for that that one outlet, and now you have level one for everyone. So it, it, it can be a solution, sometimes a short-term solution, sometimes it can become a long-term. We did see one condo unit that had dedicated 15, actually dedicated 20 amp circuits to every parking spot. <laughs> so we walked in there and we said, well, you guys are good to go. You just have to, you know, figure out how you want to charge it because people complain. They don't care if you have a block meter sucking juice 24 seven, but they care if you have an EV that's going to take an hour of electricity. So it, but at the same time, uh, we do recommend that they charge a certain fee that's going to build up a, a, a fund that you're going to be able to use for a bigger infrastructure or renewal of that infrastructure down the road. But we're going to talk about it a bit later. Good question. Um, so we do have options, though. We don't have to have one plug, one, one charger per. We have a different option. In this case here, um, you have uh, current management systems. So basically, you're going to have uh, CTs that are going to see what power is available for the building or for your installation, and it's going to control the different um, the different chargers, telling them either by Wi-Fi or uh, hardwire, depending on what. It's going to tell them yes, you can charge or or not, and control also the different. Um, Power that it's going to give to each charger. So if let's say Nick comes in and he, he need, he's at 20% and mine's at 76 and we're sharing because there's not enough power, it's going to give a bit more to Nick and a bit less to me because he knows mine's almost done charging. Um, so there's different management systems and that's really to the electrical contractor or engineering firm to figure out what's best for your needs at depending on what how many cars how many parking spot and how many power is available how much power is available yes how many of these are available commercially because you know when i was looking around in the residential space there was a couple that were like oh yeah you can hook it up to your own ocp server um but i don't know how many of these are actually available at a, at a commercial level so um right now you have different options. Uh, so you can go with the DCCs. You can go with uh, EV Duty has a pretty good one. Uh, EV One is coming with one. So you're seeing a lot more of them coming out, but also uh, electrical manufacturing like uh, Eaton, they have smart panels, which basically do the same thing, but they control the breakers instead. So it's more of a on off uh, type of situation. Um, a lot of Chargers would have, um, they, they talk to each other when they're plugged on the same circuit, they detect each other, and then they will they will power share depending on what, what's needed. But uh, often what they do, they'll just even splits. So let's say I start with 32, well, it's gonna 
split split into two, split into four, and all that. But equally, you won't kind of gauge. Uh, with the uh, EV duty one, uh, they see each charger individual uh, with the current management system. Uh, EV one is coming with the very interesting product. Uh, it was purchased by a company in Quebec last year, and they put a team of engineers into it, and they said we want to be the new like leaders in the market. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what actually comes out. It's supposed to come out in the next few months, so I'll have more info then. But they gave us a presentation, and it was kind of kind of neat. Um, so there's different current management system depending on what you need. It can be by the panel, it can be by the uh, chargers. You can have an independent one. You can have also um, for condos, you can have the VCC nines with if you have the meter base all in the one room. Uh, well, you can tap off the meter and then it's going right off your panel. So you don't need extra uh, current because we're taking it away from your panel. So if the power is available and it's charged there and built directly to you instead of having a billing account and all that. So um, let's keep going. Um, future proofing. Vehicle to grid. We all know it's coming. Uh, they've started to talk about the, the hydro companies across North America are looking at how they can use our electric cars to their benefit. Um, so vehicle to grid is a big thing. It's uh, mandated in California right now. Uh, we can use it to peak shaving. Uh, so what we want to do when we go to condos is tell them, don't buy 200 chargers. You're wasting money and you're wasting uh, resource. Just start with a few because we want a future proof. You need the infrastructure. You will need conduit. You will need wires. You will need transformers. For sure, you're going to need that power. But don't invest too much in chargers right now because it's evolving quite a bit and quite fast right now. They're talking about vehicle to grid and all that. Well, right now, bi-directional chargers, you have, I think, two or three on the market. Um, they're not there yet. They're working on it. It's coming. It's coming fast. Sorry, that's flying. And I think it's going to be my laptop. No, I don't need to. Yeah. Um, so it, it's coming on the market and you, you have to be ready for it. But right now, if you buy 200 chargers that are not V2G ready, well, you might be throwing your money away because you might get government grants down the road if you do have vehicle to grid uh, chargers. Or you might get money back by using vehicle to grid. We're not sure how it's going to work yet, but definitely they're looking to incentivize. Incentivize. Thank you. There you go. I'm French and it's late. <laughs> um, so there, that's why we don't suggest to go out and buy the whole system right away. But at the same time, there's grants that are available if you look at this. We're going to talk about in a few slides the Ziva program and all that. Uh, that will make it kind of uh, a threshold to buy a minimum of so many chargers. And most of the time, you don't have 20 people, let's say, that do want it right away. Uh, depending on on the interest, uh, some condos actually have huge interest. And then most condos with an older generation living in there don't see the benefits because they don't see past two or three years of life. <laughs> okay, so I've been to many presentations, and the last one I was at, uh, Jeff was online, he could attest to it. There was this lady in the front seat, and she was just staring right at us saying, I'm going to be dead in two years. I don't want this. <laughs> and uh, we, I, I tried to give her, like, hopes that she might not, you know, pass in that short period of time. But I think her bread. Yeah, oh, no, no, I, I tried that and it didn't work out. Anyway, so um, <laughs> definitely future proofing will include V2G, but also um, making sure when you do some installations to have the conduit big enough to accept the wires for the other 20 circuits down, you know, down that way or whatever. It, not just to spend money on what you have to install today, but see what you can actually, because a piece of conduit, it's going to cost the same to do the, the labor for a two-inch conduit and a one-inch conduit. It's going to have the same amount of screws, 
Same amount of, of straps. It's going to be a bit more expensive because the straps are maybe 20 cents more. But nobody's ever complained about having conduit that was too big. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to my aunt's girl. <laughs> You're going to edit that, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the bus. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. So, off of 10 degrees, like I was saying, uh, right now, Enercan keeps saying, and on their website, it does say that they're coming back out in spring 2024. It was supposed to be fall 2023. They did not reopen the grant. Uh, the Enercan grant is really good, especially for condos, because basically it allows you to fund up to 50% of your project to a maximum of $100,000 per project. Um, and uh, up to $5,000 per project. Uh, on, charge on top of that. So the NR the ZBIP program. So let's say that my project is two hundred thousand dollars. A hundred thousand dollars of it would be paid by uh, Enercan would be funded yeah. if you get approved by Enercan. But you need a minimum of twenty charges installed. Okay. To get that money because it's up to five thousand dollars per charger, but. That being said, I can install uh, my 20 chargers, but the infrastructure can be for my other 20 chargers down the road because I still need that infrastructure for these 20 chargers. So uh, it, it's a good program. Uh, there, it's supposed to come back out. We don't know exactly uh, the rules when it comes back out. They might tweak it, change it. Uh, they might focus it on a group. Hopefully the verbs, they are the one that needs it, that need this the most. Uh, not necessarily people at home like myself. Uh, it's kind of cool, but I, it's not going to cost me $5,000 for a charge. So, um, so that's for the ZVIP. Anything, uh, I, don't, I think I know the answer. Anything the provincial level? Um, I'm going to... Because I know PC has similar programs. We keep electing the blue party, so no. I'm going to come to this one here uh, and, and go back. So... The city of Ottawa is actually seeing uh, the need to invest a bit in MERS and in partner with EPCO, we have the pilot project uh, and, and block the EV charging in MERS. So they uh, just spend $10,000 for a pilot project to see what can help the, the, the condos and to at least get the ball rolling. Because um, often on condos, they have to do an assessment and all that. And normally the price they range in the five to seven thousand dollars just for the assessment and that's what they're the city's kind of focusing on that so thumbs up on the city uh great work for starting uh to think about evs and MERS. uh the ZBIP program with nr10 is is pretty good and the current ontario government does not believe in helping build the needs for ev uh, infrastructure uh so it's like 2018 they've been not anti-EV, but very unfriendly to the EV. Oh, and, and, and it's have billions for Honda. Yeah, yeah. yeah because well, uh, I think there's an election coming up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and it's still not for necessarily the users. It's for the one oh, company. Actually, I, I, I got uh, you. So, yeah. uh, at the same time, you know, the north, north of Ontario needs uh, charging infrastructure just for the highways and stuff, and, yeah. and they still don't give. Conservatives like socialism, but for corporations. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get too much into politics, obviously, but right now it's uh, it, it's a lot. So uh, let's come back here. So that's the ZBIP. Uh, standard recommendations that we do, like I said, 120 volt plugs. Uh, it's It's fairly cheap. Costs about two two dollars a hundred kilometers when you do that. So for the average condos, that's not going to break the bank. They won't see much of it uh, being spent. Then plan plan for deployment level two. So leverage the ZBIP program to install basic infrastructure as much as possible. Uh, panel conduit circuits, future proof it. Make sure that you're not wasting money, but you're using that money uh, for the long term goal. And then uh, eventually, 100% coverage. So when you do need it, when the demand is there, or it, you know if you have a use for it, then you want to go to 100% coverage having chargers everywhere. But being EV friendly as a condo, um, 
in Montreal, the real estate uh, committee or group, I don't have the name exactly with me right now, did a study and they figured that having an EV ready condo, like not necessarily the charger there, but being able to put a charger there, yeah, often. Um, increased the value of the condos by about $5,000. So the installation for um, a charger varies between 3,000 to like 4,500 uh, in condos uh, per, per charger when you factor in all the infrastructure and all that. So you're still adding more value than it's going to cost you. Uh, and you open your market a bit more because now you have everybody looking for EVs or even if they don't care about EVs, it's still there. Um, the steps, establish your EV needs, find out the available options, uh, establish a plan that suits your needs, reach uh, the available grants, uh, research the, the grants and establish a budget. Basically figure out your, your things and be ready for those grants. When the NRK grant comes out, it's going to go quick. I know about 20 different condos waiting for that grant to come out with their application just ready to rock. So, and that's just in Ottawa. Uh, I'm not even talking, uh, like in Gatineau, they have uh, provincial money. So they're, they're ahead with that. But the federal and provincial, right now you can combine and in some cases pay for 100% of your installation on the Quebec side. So we're falling behind in Ontario <laughs> again. Um, average price, like I was saying, twenty eight hundred to forty five hundred dollars for a uh, level two installation, um, and it all depends on the existing infrastructure and the distance. They're they're major factors. So if I'm going through nine stories and they're two hundred or four hundred feet wide, uh, you know, it, it's going to factor in that I'm I'm spreading out on a big uh, surface. If it's a smaller condo and they're all combined, they're all Together, uh, it, it helps quite a bit with the cost. If I'm doing interior, exterior, now you're you're adding more cost to it. So definitely, uh, that are those are factors. Um, the steps, like we said, uh, when we do those meetings with condos, we have a meeting with the board and management. They're the ones that reach out most often, or that we talk to first. Then we do or we get them to do a, an EV readiness assessment. So the equipment study and the usage uh, study have to be made to know what's available and what we can go on to. Uh, then we have the EMCO meeting uh, with the owners and tenants. So we do kind of a meeting like tonight and condo owners that are interested or that want to, you know, chirp us, they come. And, and we actually give them information, answer questions, and kind of put it back on track. And then presentation options. Uh, then we provide a survey, they enter the survey. That's really where we're gonna see the interest from the, the condo owners. We're gonna see if they want one or not. Uh, if uh, if it's if we have 30 people that want it, well, obviously it's worth starting and getting to it. If you have the one person that do want it in the whole building, maybe just find a 120 volt plug. And uh, so, um, then we have a meeting with the board again with the results of the survey, talk about different options, talk about different price and range, and then we uh, prepare a plan and get ready for those grants. We talked about those and that's our presentation. Any questions? Yeah, Sam, I just, yeah. I like a thing before I used to live at the Hunt Club atrium. And 30 years ago, the average age was a guy my age now. Oh. And you imagine the pushback when you come up like, hey, can't we have the gym open 24-7? And somebody say, well, then the bad guys in my neighborhood would come and, you know, go in the gym and work out at 2 o'clock in the morning. And that was the end of the discussion. I just wonder if the culture that you've seen has changed so they're more open to so what you're presenting here. They don't have much of an option. There is a, in the uh, condo court regulations and rules. Um, if a tenant or a condo owner comes with a reasonable plan to and ask for something for a charger, they cannot refuse them. So it's really important for the condo board uh, to and management to be ready with a big plan. Because if if they don't have that plan and somebody comes up with with a reasonable request, 
then they don't have a choice to do it. And then if you have 10 people that come with that request, they don't have a choice to do it. Now you're taking 10 chargers plugged with no management and you're taking that kind of uh, power away from their options. So it's important for them to have something ready, to have that, that assessment done, to know their possible their options to, to, to have current management system, to have the one system and not 20 different chargers. So um, that's something that we do uh, educate the boards because some of them didn't know about it, uh, but it, they have to be open-minded because they don't, the law says that they have to. Remember Lawrence says uh, like issues with a condo. Yeah, a lot of people had issues and then this kind of got known and now they kind of know. Uh, one of the went to was, was Marina Bay where I live. Yes. I mean, open-minded there, voted it down. There's this, sorry. Right. They voted it down. Down, yeah. yeah. Uh, they may have to get open minded later, but they're not going to do but it. But at that point, though, if you do have an EV and you come with your, your reasonable plan, yeah, <laughs> but they can't stop you from charging. It's just down the road. Well, there's no there's no oil that's anywhere near my car. No, but you can request to have power brought there and you can pay the electrician to bring the plug, yeah. uh, which is normal. You'd pay for it anyways of some kind and they can't refuse it. Um, and, and, and at that point, uh, if they do everything in their power to reduce it, yeah, they're, they're, not like, they're, they're, they're not allowed. And if you want, like we, we talked to Raymond, he knows exactly that that law. And, and if you come with it, uh, they, they can't legally do. Yeah. They, they can't. They have no ground stand. They, yeah, if we change that, but at the same time, my friend down the street, he says, if you install a charger at my place, the electricity is free for you. Huh. Sounds like a nice. That's a pretty good deal. Yeah, there you go. Why I want to talk to you. Okay. Any more questions? Those are online. No. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Sam. All right. Thanks, guys. Do. Oh, oh, Jackson. Yeah. Go ahead. Um. Yeah, because you mentioned being ready for people to grid, and I wondered myself about you know what like wiring might need in place, um, and I think I came across the answer, so I wanted to share that information. Um, but I saw a demo of a V2X solution that a company had made, and they were using it with the AI6, uh, or maybe it was the EDI. Uh, but anyway, that's not important. The point is, I initially thought maybe you'd need a separate set of wiring, like two sets of wires going to the panel, one that would go through a transfer switch. But you actually may not, and depends if our code is is you know different from the US or whatever. But in this company's solution, they set up the house with a grid disconnect. So the way the system worked is that all you need going to your charger is just a regular, uh, you know, three by wire with a neutral. So you need, you know, two hots, neutral ground, um, like what you use for a, for a stove or whatever. So you just have to make sure the neutral wire is available, obviously, because if you're going to be sending split phase power back, you need all the wires. But you don't need a whole other set of wires because the way it works is the charger communicates with the grid disconnect. And then if you need to back up our house, it will disconnect the entire house from the grid. And then the charger will ensure that that's disconnected and safe. And then it will feed power into the house. So it's a, a transfer switch at the, at the meter base, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as long, uh, so in Canada, when you have two sources of power, whether it's solar uh, generator or battery power, you do need 100% uh, isolation from and, and that's on the hot and the neutral because you can send back on the neutral and zap at alignment. Basically, you want to save their lives mm -hmm. when they're working on repairing. So, uh, yeah, you need some kind of transfer. Cool. Switch. All right, thanks. So, um, you guys probably already know how to do a road trip with an EV, but this is part of a series that we're going to do for hopefully the library, if they ever get back to me, uh, for beginners, right? Because it's, it's kind of a demystifying thing. So how to plan a road trip for an EV. So I've got some, you know, boilerplate slides about who we are. So you guys already know that since you're here and why I do this because we can borrow it from our kids and I don't my kids to you. Yes. Okay. Preparing for a road trip. Um, we cover getting your car ready, uh, charge it to 100%, that kind of thing. Pack your adapters because next year we're going to need them. Um, a tire repair kit, maybe. Good idea. They saw them on Amazon. And then winter and summer, as you guys know. Oh, so charge it up. Mm -hmm. Verify your tire repair kit so that the liquid didn't blow up in the winter. 
Yeah, so I actually got a different one from Amazon that doesn't have the goo because that like the tire people hate you when you use that. So mine is like a, it plugs a hole. It's a whole repair thing. Anyway, uh, charging up. So most of your daily me needs are met going to 80%, which is sort of a normal recommendation charge to 80. Uh, you can charge to 100 though. It's not the end of the world. People are afraid to charge to 100. It's not going to kill your car. It's totally fine. Just don't do it like all the time. Uh, but if you're going on a road trip the next day, then there's no reason you shouldn't. Uh, you can set your climate timer. To uh, Mike, Mike, news. you really should probably update that slide uh, because there's a lot of Teslas out there that are recommended to charge to 100%. Now, all of the the the, the standard range Teslas, their recommendation is 100 charge to 100% yeah. every day. I mean, if your car says that, then go for it. But the general rule is 80% for most people because not everyone drives the LFP Teslas. Follow your manufacturer's recommendation. Yep, follow your manufacturer's recommendation or 80%, whichever is better. Uh, all right, thanks, Greg. Um, set your climate timer to preheat, pre-cool the car before you leave so that you're not wasting time or energy on the battery to warm up your car. That's a really good point. point. A friend of mine bought a Model 3. Yeah, and he lives in Canada, and he took on the coldest day of the year, and he said, "Steve, I had to charge up in Castleman to get to Montreal," and he just jumped in the uh, yeah. car with a battery that feels like minus four. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you know, be next to the car, and if it's plugged in, then whatever, it'll charge, it'll warm itself up right off the mains. So then, just since this is a beginner guide, you might want to put while it's still plugged in. While it's still plugged in, okay. Yeah, thank you. Put the antic. I got it. Yep. No, that's actually a really good point. But it's a good point. I'll, I'll add that in. People are dumb. Yep. Pack your adapters. Uh, so there's a level two adapter on the left and a level three adapter on the right. Um, and so depending on what your car is, you'll need an adapter for your type of car. Some cars have CCS and some cars have Max already. And so you're going to need the adapter for the opposite going forward because then you'll be able to use all of the chargers and not just the ones that are related to your brand. Um, and so we can talk about that a little bit more if you want, but I think everyone in the room understands what that means. Um, every car sold in North America as of next year will have a J3400 plug, that's Nax. Um, so you'll need a charger like the one on the right, uh, or an adapter. Did I say charger? I meant adapter. Like the one on the right if you want to use the non-Tesla chargers. Hmm? Sorry. <laughs> Did you really that? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet you. Uh, tires. Make sure you have a tire repair kit of some sort. Most EVs don't have spare tires. It turns out most new cars don't have spare tires because it's not exactly the safest thing to be on the side of the 401, you know, lifting up your car and changing a tire. So probably, you know, for the best. It's not 1968 anymore. People drive fast stuff. Um, make sure your tires are properly inflated. A lot of EVs have tire monitoring, TPMS, right? Measuring the air pressure. But um, I did accidentally let my old car, we had my parents' Ford Escort. I was driving back to the Sioux and I blew a sidewall outside of Sudbury in the rain. Of course, it's always in the rain um, because I didn't know that the tire wasn't fully inflated properly. And so it was low and then it like, exploded so then I had to put on the donut and it was a whole thing and it was the worst and I had three hitchhikers that I picked up that were hot girls going to Okanagan <laughs> it's a whole story I was in college it was fine anyway we'll talk about that in around 30 years yeah uh, summer versus winter. So summer range is likely going to be bigger than your winter range. Um, we'll be able to go farther on the charge before having to top up. Um, that doesn't mean that the winter range is going to be abysmal like the rumors and myths all have it unless you're in the leaf. Um, uh, the winter range usually isn't too bad once you get going because the car gets warm as you're you know, fast charging and driving and stuff. So the impact isn't as bad as you would expect. Uh, cars are more efficient in warmer weather though. Um, air density is lower less rolling resistance because you're not going through slush. Uh, you don't have to heat the cabin. Uh, tires work better in the warm. Uh, unless it's too warm, we get too sticky. So anyway, that's probably not an issue. Planning your route. So there's a lot of apps available. Some people don't like having a folder full of apps, but I don't really mind, so whatever. So this is my little app folder. You can see there's like four pages of it. So yeah, um, these are the, the main ones that I use. Um, so 
If you're in doubt of a charger's location or availability, best bet is to check the network app for that specific charger. Um, but there are some general use uh, like plug share and charge hub. We'll have all the chargers and then they'll tell you what network they're with and then you can check on that specific network if you have doubts. Um, a lot of times you're probably good to go. And uh, yeah, ensure you have enough range. So um, when you're thinking of your road trip, like to drive, don't drive it like you stole it. It's not a rental, it's your car. Drive efficiently, you know, keep the cabin that you're going to use. So if you're driver, if you're if the only one in the car, you can use driver only mode and that'll extend your range a little bit. Uh, towing's going to hurt your range. So keep that in mind when you're planning your trip. Make sure you have some redundancy charging spots in mind. Um, the gasometer in your car um, is called a gasometer for the reason, uh, especially if it's a Leaf. Um, but if it's not a Leaf, like if it's a Hyundai, a good car, um, then it's a bit more accurate. So you can actually rely on it, but some cars are a little less accurate. So uh, as you get to know your car, you'll know if you can trust your gasometer or not. Um, and yeah, extreme cold does affect your battery. Uh, so it'll give you a bit less range. So plan on that if you're going out and it's minus 30 out. Uh, wind chill does not matter for cars. That's not a thing. That's a human thing. So if it's minus 40 on the wind chill, but only minus 20 on the thermometer, then it's minus 20 as far as the car is concerned. Wind chill is just something that humans feel. Uh, so it's not a real number. Um, and yeah, well, I, pretty, I would disagree with you there uh, in the sense that if it's minus 40, that's because there's a pretty big gust. And if you're driving into I mean, a gust of yeah, wind, wind resistance will be a thing. But if but, the gust is in the same direction a year ago. But if it's a tailwind, then yeah, you're good to go. It'll actually extend your range. Yeah. So wind It'll chill. extend your range. As far as the temperature thing goes, wind chill doesn't count. It's it's an it's a made up number. Um, but yeah, preheat while you're plugged in when possible. See, I've, I've got it in there. Headwinds. I got there. I think headwinds. Headwinds. Headwinds will help or hurt as well. But that's true for airplanes. Flying a plane. Just like flying a plane. Um, ask me how I know. All right, non-Tesla charging infrastructure looks like this. You guys have all seen this slide, um, but this always shocks people. Like, oh my God, there's so many chargers. Um, the Tesla charger network looks like this, and then next year I'm going to update the slide to have it all in one, so there's no differentiation, so everyone will just be happy. It'll just be to look like it'll have a few more dots, but uh, you can see the Tesla ones cover everything too. So that's pretty cool. And then so here's an imaginary road trip I did or planned um, in my Ionic 5. And um, yeah, so it takes, you know, just over six hours to go from here to Toronto, which a lot of people like to do. Um, and that's in, including the two charging stops, one in Kingston for 23 minutes where I will have lunch and then one in Oshawa for 10 minutes, just to make sure I don't run out while I'm stuck on the 401 in traffic, probably. Um, and I just chose downtown Toronto, but obviously you would go somewhere else. Um, and yeah, so it's not like you can't do a road trip and this is taking the uh, death sport that is the 401 rather than highway seven, just to prove that you can do it. Um, and if you were towing, you would probably want to do this anyway because of all the chargers along the route. So you'd have a lot of fallback chargers to go to if you end up a little short because you're towing a big brick. Um, but this is sort of a sample of what it looks like. And um, hang on, I got a super product that you use. So this is the charge hub. Uh, oh, actually, it's a better route planner for this. So this is a better route planner. Um, but yeah, it tells you how long to charge and all that. Um, pretty good. And uh, yeah. Questions. You, so you, you, when you go on a road trip, you show, choose your place to charge before you leave? Um, not really, not now. Yeah. Like I'm familiar enough with my car that I, I sort of have an idea of where the chargers are going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily do this, but if you're a new person, like a beginner, then definitely do something like this. But so you're not looking up on the car or on a cell phone or anything like that? Um, well, actually, so for what I do for real is I just use a nav in the car and set my destination and let the okay. car figure it out. Okay. Um, but I mean, if you want to get a sense like the week before, you're like nervous about it, then you can use a tool like this and it'll you know, understand. Um, if I'm going to Toronto or Montreal, I don't check. I just go because I know those charges along the way. So it's like, mm -hmm. whatever, I'll just wing it. Um, but if you go to like Northern Ontario, I might do a bit more planning. But it's not a, it's not a big deal like people expect. Um, so DC fast chargers, they have different connectors, and that will be the case for the next little while. But we will slowly transition to one connector to rule them all. Um, pick, uh, on the 401. Where this is? Yeah. yeah. This is in. Kingston. Nope. Nope. It's Toronto-ish. It's um, this was on my thousand kilometer road trip I did Arkham. two weeks ago. 
So Oshawa? I think this is the Oshawa. Like it likes by Canada and Oshawa. Um, yeah, and so that bolt on the right there was actually at the 350 kilowatt station, of course. Yeah. Um, and then the rest are 150. And so we were all annoyed um, because he's, you know, trucking along at 42 kilowatts. Like, good job, bud. He was there. I We came, we charged, we left, and he had only gone up like 10%. Hmm. Uh, so anyway, so different charger. So this is CC, this is CCS. Um, this is what the non Tesla is currently used for fast charging, unless it's a leaf, and then I'm not even going to talk about the leaf. Um, so, this is used for type three, level three, fast charging, direct current. Modern EVs take around a half an hour ish to get to 80%. Some are a bit longer, some are a bit sl slower, uh, like some are a bit faster. Um, my car is under 20 minutes, um, that's a little exceptional. Um, the, they have different charging speeds. I was just talking about the 150 and 350 kilowatt. Um, some of them are as slow as 50 kilowatts. Those are usually the flows, but they are reliable as hell. So they will take a lot longer, but they work. Um, whereas a lot of the newer ones are 150, which is great. Those are pretty fast. And then the 350s are fantastic if they're working. Um, and usually they're no, I've had decent luck. Um, so they're usually okay. Um, and then 350 is currently the fastest you can get. Um, but they have different ranges. It'll show you on the charging stand how fast that particular uh, unit is. Uh, but you also have to know a little bit about your car to know what your car can accept. Uh, the Bolt can only accept 50 kilowatts, and then it maxes out. So you can go to a 350 like the other guy did, but you're only going to top out at 50 because um, that's all your car can do. Um, a lot of cars are in the 150 range. Um, the Kona is like 77 kilowatts, so it's kind of a weird one. Um, and then the Ionic 5, all the EGMP, the Honda Kia, Genesis cars, they can all do 350. So they they top out at like 270 or whatever it is. Um, so they're fast. So you'll learn your car. Um, it'll say it in the manual. Um, so your car is the limiting factor on that, and that's CCS. And then there's Tesla, which uses the now J3400 standard. All future EVs starting next year, model year 2025, will have that connector instead. And so you need adapters. Uh, so the one for the unwashed masses is the one in the middle there, the uh, Tesla to CCS connector. And then the one on the top is for the going the other way, CCS to Tesla. Um, and yeah, question. Yeah, where do you get the adapters? Uh, your car maker will provide them to you when you're allowed to use the Tesla network. So that'll be forthcoming. Oh, yeah. Look for a letter in the mail. Okay. Um, if you're a Tesla owner, you can just go to the Tesla store and buy the CCS to Tesla one right now. Okay. It's already out. Um, but if you're a non-Tesla owner, then yeah, look for your car maker to have one available like, at some like point. Email. It might be email, it might be a letter mail. You might have to bug your dealer. It depends on sort of how okay. your setup is next year. This is well starting this year. So if you're a Ford, a Rivian, or a there's a third one, Chevy, GM. Is GM on there now? I think GM is allowed now. Lyrics, yeah, because lyrics can charge. So if you're Ford, GM, or Rivian right now. Um, you can charge on a uh, on a Tesla adapter. I think uh, Hyundai would jump on that. Who? Hyundai. Hyundai is part of the thing. They're just waiting on Tesla to give them the green light. It's, so Tesla has to do stuff on their end to enable charging for a specific brand because the charger talks to the car, right? And if, they, if it's like, no, nope, you're not allowed, then you're not allowed yeah. and it won't charge. Uh, so they have to do some stuff on Tesla's end to enable certain brands to charge, and they probably have to do some, you know, compliance testing and all that to make sure it's going to be a decent experience. Um, there are some uh, supercharger stations that have the magic. Yes, so there are some magic dock stations which already allow you to charge. Um, if you use a better rock finder. It'll tell you it'll rock you to those ones. Yeah. Tell you can charge both. So yeah, ABRP will tell you, or the Tesla app will tell you which ones. Currently, the only ones available in Canada are between Ottawa and Sudbury. So those superchargers have been outfitted with adapters built into the charging stall. Uh, so if you're going to Sudbury, you can use Tesla superchargers on one way, and you don't need to do anything special. It's just there, and you use the app. You have to use the Tesla app to enable it. But, um, and then there's a bunch in New York. Yeah. Um, but that's it for us. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, next slide. Hmm. So using a DCFC. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so they all work differently, which is kind of annoying, but not the end of the world. 
hopefully with Nax, they will start moving to a plug and charge model where you just rock up and plug in and then just work. Um, but for now, sometimes you need to enable it with the app first. It's like you have to use the app to authorize it and then it will unlock it from the thing and then you can put it into the car. And other stations, you plug it into the car first and then you tell the app which unit you're using um, before it'll authenticate. So there's different ways. Uh, you'll learn which networks you prefer and that's that's fine. Um, there's a bit of etiquette involved here. So generally you don't want to charge more than 80% at a fast charger and that is because it takes so much longer to go from 80 to 100 than it goes from 10 to 80. Uh, so if it takes you like 20 minutes to go from 10 to 80, like my car, it'll take you another 20 minutes to do that last little bit. Um, so it's not worth it. Your best bet is to stop at 80 and then move on, drive another three, four hours, and then get another charge. Um, know how fast your car can charge, so you're not blocking a charger that is overkill for what your car can do, um, like the Bolt. And uh, they cost quite a bit now. They've changed. They've all changed from a time-based um, cost to a kilowatt-hour based cost, which is more fair. Like in in general, it's more fair. That's fine, but it means it's more expensive for everyone, which I guess is also fine if we want to support the whole charging network thing and make sure that they actually have a business model that's viable. Because these things are not cheap to install. They're not cheap to operate, and we kind of need them. Um, and before it was like my car because it charged so fast i could rock up to a fast charger be there for 10 minutes and then leave and pay a fraction of what the bolt guy would pay because he's there for an hour um and yet we're getting the same amount of energy right um which is not really equitable still less than a dollar 70 liter but it's still less than a dollar 70 liter it's still about the half the cost of gas well, the thing um, is, my so, yeah. perspective is that you're not paying for the electricity, you're paying for the infrastructure. Yeah. So charging by the time is actually more fair in that sense. Yeah, I mean, we can have a whole conversation on this at the round table, but there's a, a hybrid model where there's like a time factor would probably be the best bet. To but that, that's too complicated. But that gets complicated. Well, so Tesla, like, it's a really busy supercharger, yeah. limit to 80%. 90, 90, 90, 90, yeah. 90. Okay. Like, if you need to but go it, it's above fair. 80% for whatever reason, and so I did this um, for a Northern Ontario trip where I knew it was a long stretch between chargers, and I charged to 90% to make sure I could do it. Hang around in your car because you don't want some some chad to come along and like be annoyed that you're there charging past 80 and you can just tell them like look man i gotta i gotta go to you know campus casing or whatever you know i need that extra 10 percent um and usually people are fine if you're just sort of nice about it um, but there are dinguses out there that will try and you know give you a hard time for using a tesla charger when you're not allowed even though you're you know driving a rivian or whatever um so there is that um, basically be nice to people, like people are all learning this stuff. A lot of new people are getting EVs all the time to so have some, you know, sympathy. Um, don't block other chargers if you can help it. That's going to be a problem for Tesla because their chargers are all in their charging ports on the wrong side of the car. And so all the Teslas have the wrong side of the car for charging, which means that when non Teslas use them, they have to block well, that, you can We're not going to touch it. We can say the opposite. No, no, because <laughs> no, I agree with charging that. on the passenger right. side makes the most sense. And the reason is because of on-street parking. If yeah. you need to charge on the street, it's on the curb side. That's where you want the charger so that you don't get taken yeah. out by a bus. Well, it's charging in Montreal. Yeah. I hook the cable underneath the bus. So so yeah. the, the, the reason, that, and I know like you, you, you might disagree with this, but when you get out of a Tesla, you just go through that. But there's no reason Tesla, Tesla could have done that on the other side of the car. Or had two ports. Or had two ports. But whatever. We're not going to get into that debate. It's fine. Don't unplug other people regardless of their state of charge. That is a jerk move. And a lot of cars lock their charging thing anyway, so it's not going to come out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, don't stay plugged in if you're done. Uh, most chargers now have an idle fee, which is very horrendously steep. Um, so you will get burned if you take off and your car is done and you're 20 minutes late it's, it's like, so it's like a minute, a minute. So, a minute with tesla yeah or more depending on the network right so don't do that that's me um and now i have captain planet here to help us with questions if anybody has any questions hey, whatsoever you see here do oh no thanks man he has a mullet <laughs> <laughs> and it's blue so whatever i don't have his abs uh whatever I, okay I, so no more questions. Yeah, sure. Good.
How many adapters do I need? We apps do I need? Well, you need as many apps as you want. So um, okay. the maximum number of adapters you need is two. Uh, one for level two, one for level three. What if I'm not beta to to run your record? Yeah, what if I'm doing beta? L? Oh, beta L is a whole new yeah. thing. That's for Hyundai Kia special people only. And that's where we can run houses and stuff. And actually, sorry, it's not Cybertruck. Oh, the Cybertruck. Yeah, they have their special. And the new model wise. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah, Without any ado being further, I don't want to take all night yeah, for yeah. our meetings, which we normally run over time. We're going to go to the news. When, Simon, when Sam is ready. All right. News. Lots of news. Terry, uh, question, Mike. Okay, go ahead. Is that Alan? Yes, um, I don't have a Leaf, but I have a Chatamo uh, car. So, okay, yeah. um, is there an adapter uh, available for getting... That's Terry. Um, is that? Is that Terry? Are you... Yeah. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, no. Um, there is no adapter. Chatamo is a completely different language. Like the, the protocols are completely different than CCS and Max. And there used to be a Tesla one that was expensive and heavy and enormous. And it was Chatamo to And it was Chatamo to NAC, well, to Tesla, to Tesla. B- before NAX. Um, and it was proprietary to Tesla um, and expensive as heck. But no, a Chatamo is a deprecated standard now. So it's they're going to phase them out. Sorry. So oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there a standard that they will provide at least one charger in a bank for no. Chatamo? No, no, that's over as well. So the legacy Chatamo that exists are probably all you're going to get. A lot of the char- uh, charging providers have already said that they're going to no longer install new Chatamo stands. Um, Electrify Canada was doing it for a bit, and I think they've stopped now. So. Yeah, Chatamo is a dying standard, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. I mean, okay. it sucks, but I like the reference to tanks. <laughs> to tea, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. Japanese for something about having tea. But that's starting to while we well, you have, have tea. tea while yeah. So, what type of van is that? So that is an Econo Line one hundred and fifty that was converted. Oh. Okay. Um, that Luke spotted and took a picture of because it was cool. And apparently it has a CCS port on it. So somebody did an interesting mod, um, which is really cool. And then, of course, we had the Eclipse because there was no other picture. So I thought I would share mine of the Eclipse because it was April. We had an Eclipse. So now it's going to be on YouTube forever. Cool. Honda is going to build batteries and EVs, so they're going to do the whole meal deal for Ontario. They're going to do everything from the cells all the way through to the complete car in Ontario. Um, This is ignoring the fact that they don't currently produce EVs at all. Um, The one EV that they do have coming to market, the Prologue, is a General Motors car uh, that they rebadge. So I'm curious to see what Honda is going to announce uh, that they're going to build in their shiny new factories. Because that'll be good. There's a lot of people who are diehard uh, Honda fans, and they don't want to look at any other brand for reasons. And so it'll be great to see Honda actually starting to make the transition. I think they're going to be one of the first Japanese companies to actually get on board, and they might actually survive. So that's fantastic. Um, They're going to join the VW plant that's being built and the Stellantis LG plant that is currently being built as well. So there's a lot of EV infrastructure being built in Ontario. Well, not infrastructure, but uh, factories. Too bad yeah. don't give some money for uh, charging infrastructure. You yeah, no, like I, like I mentioned earlier, conservatives are all about welfare and socialism for corporations, not for people. There's a thing for somebody. I guess they're legal people, so. Um, so Jane Goodall, I was sad to see this. Um, she's not dead or anything, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but she is anti-carbon tax and anti-EV a little bit because she's bought into a lot of the myths and nonsense about EVs. Um, She thinks that there are other ways to source battery minerals that aren't lithium. So if she knows of a new chemistry that we're not aware of, that's great. But I don't I think she's just buying into a lot of the FUD. Um, She fears that mining lithium is bad for the planet, which it is. Um, But that is to ignore the fact that oil must be mined as well and in vastly larger quantities than lithium will ever need to be mined. Um, If we all switch to electric cars and electrification in general, um, global mining will decrease by 99% because that is how much oil we currently extract. 
So if you're afraid, if you think mining is bad for the planet, then you should be supporting electrification and getting off fossil fuels because that is the fastest way to do that. Um, yeah, she did make a good point about how big oil basically is using carbon taxes as a get out of jail free card by just paying a small fine. And then, and Toyota sort of underscored that by saying that they would rather pay for carbon offsets than invest in EV technology. So there is some truth to that. Um, but yeah, so even the most you know progressive of us who are climate warriors for OG climate warriors are still falling victim to myths and nonsense. Uh, Hyundai Kia has revealed a $50 billion plan to um, keep making more EVs. They're going to hire 80,000 people in Korea. Um, and they want, they're want they aiming to be one of the top three EV makers by 2030, including the Chinese companies. So they're going up against BYD and cattle and all of them. So they have big plans. So while Ford and GM are scaling back their EV plans, this is Hyundai Kia doubling down or tripling down and toppling down. Um, half of the investment is going to be used for EV infrastructure and manufacturing, while the rest will be used for software and battery technology. Um, they expect to have a new EV plant in Korea come online any day now, um, and that'll enable them to have the EV3 go on sale in Korea first and then other markets later, as you saw in the cars coming up this year. Um, they're going to have 31 electric vehicle models by on sale by 2030. So in six years, they're going to have a whole bunch of cars available. And some of those are already up. Hmm? Do they even have 31 ICE models right now? I don't think so. Well, this is, so this is Hyundai Kia Genesis combined, right? So this is the it's 10 each, the mega core. So it's like 10 each. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think they have 10 models each. I mean, their plans are to be 100% electric by like 2033 or something. So this is putting money where their mouth is, right? Um, Ford takes second place in the US EV market. So they um, apparently took first year economics and discovered that when you lower prices, demand increases. Um, and so they did that. And then their demand increased, um, which is really good. So their sales climbed 86% um, in Q1 of this year. Um, and that is because they slashed prices on their cars. So, Mike, what's the story with all these news articles you're hearing, like Florida slashing, like uh, they yeah. can't sell their EVs? I so, we can talk to that. I can talk about it, about that. I've talked about it a little bit before, but basically, Ford misjudged the market, and they came out with a, a trophy truck and an expensive sports car that doesn't compete well on price or performance, even uh, with some of the other entrants in the market, right? And so they had expensive cars that nobody was buying, and so they were scaling back their plans because they screwed up basically they're trying to cover their their mistake um gm is the other one that was putting out the stuff that they're scaling back EV plans and that is because they had a different kind of screw up they made good cars but they just didn't physically make them because they couldn't make the batteries fast enough the, the battery modules and so they were saving face by saying oh well we meant to scale back production never mind that we couldn't actually produce cars for an entire year so they had plans last year to make 80,000 EVs and they made 13,000, right? And so that was a colossal screw up on their side. Um, and so they're they're both basically saving face, one because they misjudged the car market and the other because they just couldn't figure out how to build cars. Um, so I'm still waiting for all those people to be proven right, who in the early days were like, well, we'll just wait until the big automotive companies start building EVs because they know how to make real cars real good, right? Remember that? Yeah, everybody. Right? Right. Everyone used to say that, and now you never hear from them anymore. It's I like, mean, everybody, 15 years, guys. When, when's it going to happen? I mean, say everybody I've ever talked to them both loves the little cars. They're yeah. little cars by all accounts. Yeah. Uh, so that's what happened there. So anyway, their demand has increased, which is great. Um, and they're actually, so now they're afraid of the Chinese. So they shelved the Escape, the three row, is it the Escape Explorer? The three row Explorer, they've shelved it to focus on cheaper cars because they've discovered that when the prices are lower, people buy more, um, which is, I know, shocking if you've never been to economics class in first year or even high school. Um, but so now they're focusing on cheaper cars, um, which are going to come out in a couple of years, because they have to actually start figuring out how to make those. Um, so they that's where Ford is going, because the Chinese already have cheap cars on the market, and the U.S. is doing everything they can to prevent those cars from entering our market, because it'll be a massacre. If they do, 
Um, just like it was in the 70s and 80s when the Japanese showed up and destroyed the big three. And then in the 90s when the Koreans came with their cheap cards, the Chinese want to do the same, but, you know, fool me twice. Shame on me kind of things, I guess. I can never be fooled again or whatever Bush said. Germany actually went out. Yeah. You can get Chinese cars. If, if yeah. I went to a rental car station and said, well, do you, I, I couldn't even understand what model it was. Sorry. Yeah. A BYD. Yeah. There's a there's the BYD. The, well, there's there's the a whole bunch of cars. There's the Hats. Yeah, there's the, the, heard the name before, but yeah, they are. There's they one are. named after a cat, I think. There's a bunch. There's one that looks like a Porsche, but it's named after a cat. So, anyway. Um, Canoe spent twice as much um, as it earned on private jets for its huh. CEO. So not a good look for Canoe. I'm hoping they like become a thing because they have some really cool ideas. Um, kind of ugly cars, but they're like they're cool, right? They're new and different. Um, yeah, so is the Leaf. Fair. <laughs> Um, so they, they do have, like, they're a commercial supplier at the moment, and they have commitments to make a whole bunch of cars. And so they are delivering vehicles to customers at the moment. Um, but it's not a great look when they spend, you know, $1.7 million um, for their jet-setting CEO to fly around the U.S. Private jets of all things. On private jets of all things, when they're only making $800,000. And they're losing a ton of money, right? So not a great look for Canoe. We hope the you know, do better. Um, Rivian hits 100,000 EVs. So they built 100,000 EVs in normal Illinois. And that's the R1T and R1S. Um, they first hit the market in 2021. So only three years ago, if my math works. Um, and they're going to start ramping up R2 and R3s. Um, but they're building a whole new factory to do that. The R2 will come out of normal. The R3 will be in the new building that they're building currently. Um, and I saw somewhere that they did this faster than Tesla somehow, but I, that doesn't matter. So good for them. Does good that include? Them. Does that include the Rivians? Yes. Uh, sorry, the, the um, Amazon delivery vans, the hundred thousand. No, these are just the R ones. So, yeah, these are just the R ones, the R one S and R one T. Uh, the commercial sales aren't part of that number. That's okay. So that's an impressive number. Right? It so is. Go Rivian. Yeah, they're making like, I think they're up to like 25,000 a quarter or something. It's, I don't know. Anyway, don't quote me on that. I don't, I just made that up. Um, Chevy Silverado gets Canadian range for one version and pricing. Um, the RST first edition, which is the one that you can buy as a mere mortal and not a company. Um, I mean, if you have 120,000 burning a hole in your pocket, that's Canadian dollars. So that's something. Uh, 700 kilometer range, not too bad. And actually, so you can get more than that because some YouTubers got their hands on the uh, RST and did like 720, something like that. Uh, so that's cool. Um, the fleet package is the most affordable one, uh, which is their bare bones. It doesn't look like that. It has more plastic on the front. Um, but if you're in the market for a work truck, electric truck, these are now going to be on sale. So there you go. Very long range and all that good stuff. Um, GM's. Altium car plants are apparently back on track. I was just talking about how they couldn't make cars last year, and now they apparently can. Um, they've got a 300% increase in module production, which was the thing that was holding them up last year. Um, they sold almost as many cars in the last three months of this, like in the first quarter of this year, the, pre, the last three months it just happened, than they did in all of last year. So that's you know, that's good. More movement on the BMs. Yeah. That's zero. Yeah. Um, best selling model is still the Lyric because the Equinox, Silverado, and Sierra aren't out yet, and the Blazer is slowly getting underway. So uh, look for that to change, of course, as the Blazer gets more and more out there. But uh, for now, the Lyric is driving it. Sold it as well as uh, last weekend. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good car. Beautiful. So there you go. So, GM, we're counting on you. Mercedes has revealed the Galenda wagon or the G wagon to us normal people. Oh, that's what it's called. Eh? Oh. Yeah, there you go. So, this was originally introduced in the 1970s as a military Jeep replacement. And now it is a soccer player play toy for Saudi Arabian and UAE princes. Huh. Um, they cost 144,000 US. 
Um, they haven't announced the pricing on the electric one, but the gas ones start around 144k. So, yeah, um, as you can imagine, it has a 200 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, no, sorry, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, a 116 kilowatt hour battery. Sorry, my mistake. Um, but it doesn't have the greatest range because it's a box. They did do some aero treatments. They rounded the A pillar a little bit, that black stripe next to the windshield. They sort of smoothed that over a little bit. Um, on the fenders, they made some holes to make an air curtain around the wheels. Um, and it didn't really help that much because it's still a box. Um, so you have a huge battery. You're not going to get a great amount of range. It's like 200 something kilometers because it's a box. Uh, but it's a very capable off-roader. It has a two-speed transmission, so you can do rock crawling. It's got locking differentials and all the good stuff. It can do a tank turn um, because it has four motors, one on each wheel, so you can do the whole turning in, in place thing. Um, super good on tires. Super great for your tires. I highly recommend and, and it. Um, yeah. Uh, and it can recharge at 200 kilowatts, which is fast, so that's cool. Um, but yeah, the range, it wasn't officially announced, but some YouTubers got their hands on the cars. And German range estimates are usually pretty conservative too, but... Yeah, yeah, but Top Gear got their hands on it, and they played with it in the desert, and they were like, yeah. Okay, but though it is in the desert, desert that's all those top Like, you're there, driving right? over a sand. That's fair, that's fair. That's fair. Energy. Like, even, yeah. well, let's say it consumes 30 kilowatt hours per kilometer, which is sure. really pretty high consumption. It's going to give you, like, almost 400 kilometers. Yeah, they expect the time to lose. So, I think yeah. it would be... Really hard to get all the way down to 200 something. Okay. Guys, let's just not forget that that like this G wagon is not. It'll never see the desert. No, no but it, it's not made for, like for range for this. No, it's it's made it's, for it's, ruggedness it's, and off road ability. No, but it, it's mainly to go on the strip and show off your bikes. I mean, Actually, there, there is a legitimate military version. The Canadian Armed Forces have G wagons. Okay, so there is the, the military one still exists. Yeah. But it's diesel. Yeah, they actually don't remember the, the range being like 216 miles, not kilometers. Yeah, that sounds like maybe I got the units wrong. So there, anyway, awesome. it's fine, whatever. It can do 100% grade, uh, which is 45 degrees, by the way. So that's that's neat. Electric Range Rover has been teased, and shockingly, it looks identical to the gas one. Um, I, if you're in the market for you know, soccer player cars. There's another one. Uh, with all that money you've got from stuff, um, it promises V8 performance with zero emissions. That's the tagline. They gave you like no specs. <laughs> right. <laughs> so expect lots of noise and very little movement. Um, and, and I mean, it's a Range Rover, so we know that the electronics are going to be solid. <laughs> um, yeah. And on, the, on the bright side, they're like Mercedes with the G Wagon and uh, Range Rover. With the Land Rover, they're trying to take those V8 gas guzzlers off the street by giving you the same, uh, yeah, I'm gonna say like performance or whatever. Well, yeah. more the elegance and you know, luxury. yeah. So they're marketing this as like the quietest, most refined Range Rover because everyone knows nobody takes Range Rovers off road. They take them to the soccer practice and the school and the grocery run, except for um, and the casino, except for Top Gear. They're using this camera. Yeah. But that's because they're British. Uh, so Jeep, um, in its infinite wisdom, um, is considering a gas-powered version of the recon and wagon here for some reason. Um, they want to sell a million vehicles in the U.S., which would be more than triple, about triple what they currently sell. Um, they want to do that next year, I think, was their goal. And to do that, they they know they're not going to be able to scale EVs, so they're considering making gas versions of their EVs, which I guess, good luck with that. Um, the still a large platform apparently can come with a combustion powered setup. Um, and they think that if they don't make these gas powered rock crawlers, no, but somebody else will. So there's a little bit of fear nonsense in there. Um, yeah, so that sucks, but whatever. Fisker, I don't know if they're already bankrupt, but it's any day now. Um, sad to hear. We saw Fisker not so long ago in a Tim Hortons parking lot. Um, not Tim Hortons, Harvey's. Harvey's, the most Canadian parking lot ever. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so I've taken them off the buyer's guide so nobody can complain to us that we're like promoting them if they buy them and then realize that the company is no longer there to support them. Um, they're expected to file bankruptcy in the next month if they can't get real credit or relief. They defaulted on an $8.4 million payment in March. So. And they were to get listed from the New York Stock Exchange. So it's not looking great for Fisker, which is sad because they had like a cool car. The software could be fixed, right? The problems with it could be fixed. Um, and then they had some new interesting cars coming up too, but I guess not anymore. So if you own a Fisker, I'm very sorry. Good luck. Keep it. Like, don't drive it. Like, put it in a garage and it'll be worth something in 30 years. Yeah, it's one of the last, like a DeLorean. But like the car really. Or my iPhone <laughs> version 2. Like DeLoreans. It'll be like a DeLorean. Yeah. Um, all right. So the U.S. is pressuring Mexico. We were just talking about this, actually. Uh, the U.S. is pressuring Mexico to um, restrict Chinese cart factories. So the Chinese want to come to North America because it's a huge market. And they, if they build a factory in Mexico, Mexico is part of NAFTA. I refuse to call it whatever Trump renamed it to. Um, and so if they make them in Mexico then they don't have the tariffs that are currently being levied against Chinese cars, right? Because even if China, like they have a $10,000 BYD car, which is fantastic, but if they were to import it into North America, it would be like triple the price because tariffs, right? Protectionism. But if they build that $10,000 car in Mexico, then they can sell it as a $10,000 car in Canada. Um, but the US has cotton wise to their plans and so has started pressuring the Mexican government, which is famously uncorruptible, um, to remove incentives and tariffs or, you know, incentives and slap tariffs on Chinese cars and, you know, try and get them to not let the Chinese build cars in Mexico and export them to Canada and the U.S. Um, so 20 car makers are already present in Mexico and uh, they're planning on building cars there. So we'll see how this plays out. But uh, hopefully... This doesn't work. Hopefully we get those cars because we need cheaper cars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Toyota Mirai owners are uh, suing Toyota. Because they have hydrogen fuel cell cars that they cannot uh, currently fuel. Um, so they're suing them for they're suing them for uh, false promises and um, that kind of thing. Um, Toyota has been pushing hydrogen since the 90s, and clearly it's worked out um, since everyone drives hydrogen. Um, Shell has just pulled out of the hydrogen market and is closing down all of their stations. And um, so a lot of owners are feeling sort of duped by this whole hydrogen scheme. Um, and some of them have to drive half a tank to get to a, a filling station. So they use half a tank to get to the thing, and then they have to go home again. And how much does half a tank of hydrogen cost? A hundred dollars US. Yeah. Wow. So they use a hundred dollars of hydrogen to buy two hundred dollars worth of hydrogen, to then yeah. use a hundred dollars to get home to sleep yeah. at night, and then do it all right tomorrow, tomorrow. I guess. I don't know. It should be the biggest thing. Yeah. No, it it doesn't make much sense. Hence the maybe, lawsuit. Maybe it's a quarter there and a quarter back. No, no, they said they interviewed a guy. 50% of his tank is used just to get to the hydrogen place. And now that they're closing down, it's going to be well, worse. Too. Yeah. Um, so they already experience severe depreciation on these cars. People talk about EV depreciation. They haven't heard about hydrogen cars. 72% value loss in the first two years. And keep in mind that Mirai sells is like an $80,000 car. Um, you can pick them up used for around 20, something like that, after two years old. Um, it's crazy. And uh, yeah, so they're hoping for a buyback. So they want Toyota to just buy these cars back and get rid of them. A lot of owners end up having to like tow their cars to this hydrogen station. And then they experience fun things like how the cars get frozen to the station. And then they have to wait for an attendant to come and thaw out the, the nozzle, which takes an hour apparently. In California, I was going to say it's because um, it's freezing in California. Yeah, because California is known for their cold temperatures. Um, and so, it, like, what happens when that happens, obviously, is that there's a line starts because the charger's stuck or the filler is stuck. Um, and then people just abandon cars at the police stations. 
and it's a mess, right? And so, yeah. But Mike, I just heard that they're opening a new hydrogen station in California for long haul trucking, and that hydrogen is the future for long haul trucking. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> No comments. You are not yeah. uh, one thing about the Mirai is that it's tank yeah. needs uh, to be pressurized up to 10,000 psi to get yeah. fuel. And a lot of hydrogen stations actually are only able to do 5,000. Yeah. So in a lot of cases, you're only able to basically half build the tank. Do you know what's station. another fun thing about hydrogen cars that I just learned? So you know how everyone's like, an EV battery lasts like eight years and you have to replace the whole battery, blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah. it's complete bullshit, right? I'm going to swear on YouTube, it's fine. Hydrogen tanks can literally only be certified for like five to 10 years before they have to be replaced because it's a pressure vessel, right? Like what is the oldest propane tank that you can get refilled, right? They could, it's hydrogen's worse because they're at higher pressures and cryogenic. But Mike, it gets right. worse because you also need a filter for the air going into the fuel cell, mm -hmm. which you need to replace every six months to a year, depending on how yeah. much you drive. Oh, yeah, no, it's definitely it's about uh, $200. Yeah, but I, I learned about the having to replace the hydrogen tank on your car, um, I think, after like, I think it's eight years. Yeah. It feels and then, like, you have to do it or else your car explodes, right? Because mm -hmm. if the tank fails, it's a catastrophic failure, mm -hmm. right? Like, if the car blows up, the fuel cell itself only is. Like around, I think it's fifteen hundred to two thousand right. hours, and they and they crack the fuel cells yeah. can crack and stuff, and it's so it's it's a big mess, and clearly yeah, it's just but world. clearly it's better than EVs, obviously. But at least the hydrogen all comes from green, green methane. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, dug it out of the ground. I think and we then beat that horse. We're gonna stop. Yeah, that horse is done. <laughs> okay, Subaru might also survive the EV transition now. Slowly, can I just say that? Yeah. Um, they're retiring the legacy, which is like their sedan, um, to make way for EVs, right? It's like, what is happening in Japan right now? Um, they are launching the Solterra. They've already launched it. You can go buy one. Um, and that was a partnership thing with Toyota, so they don't actually have their own EV platform yet, but they're working on one. And they want to have, they've changed, the new CEO has changed their plans from 40% hybrid electrics by 2030 to 50% EVs by 2030. So we increase the percentage and remove the whole hybrid nonsense out of it. Um, so that is- car that was losing your wheels then. Well, yes. okay, yeah. that's a Toyota. So that's Subaru's cool. making new EV platform, okay? Give them a chance. But that- They're whole, new. Yes, this whole there is the one. Yeah. Yes, this whole, yes, and the uh, Biz Forks. So they expect their first EV uh, next year, and then production in the US will start in 2027. Um, and they're going to launch four new EVs by the end of 2026. So this is great news. I hope it it works. We'll watch next spring what happens because we're going to announce the first one next spring, a year from now. Um, whole new EV platform. So hopefully it's 800 volt and it'll be max and all that good stuff. Uh, global EV sales are robust according to the International Energy Agency. So I mean, if these guys are saying it's robust, then you know it's robust because. Like these guys are so pessimistic about EVs that if there was a snowball chance in hell that EVs were flattening out or declining or whatever, they'd be all over it because that would actually prove them right in the past. Um, but they're not, right? And so we all know this, so this is not really news to us, but um, it's nice to see that the IEA is agreeing finally. And just take a stab in there, 17 million EVs be sold worldwide with 10 million in China. Yeah, so China has the lion's share of EVs. Crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. More EVs were sold in Q1 of this year than in all of 2020. So that's great. And yeah, 45% of all cars that are electric are sold in China. Uh, or no, sorry, 45% of all cars sold in China will be electric. So almost half. They're way up that adoption curve. Um, gotcha. And Europe is at 25% right now. Quebec is at 20%. So. Uh, but Canada's yeah, but just at 10, we're going to hit 15 this year. Spec kids are moving their incentives. Yeah, but that no, might be okay. We'll see. Yeah. They're facing them. Uh, Denmark or Sweden is unfortunately 60%. Norway is like 100. Norway, yeah. Norway is like 92 people. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, so 14 million were sold last year, and uh, 17 million this year will be sold, probably, or more even, because these guys are usually a little behind the curve. Uh, Tesla announces plans to build cheaper cars. I heard the, well, I watched the edited version of the, the meetings call that removed all the ums and ahs to make it much shorter. Um, 
but they're gonna they're gonna do a robo taxi event on august 8th because they've been promising that since 2016. Uh, so now it's time to finally deliver on the robo taxi um and apparently they're gonna fast track their cheaper car since they haven't come out with anything new in years um to the second half of 2025. Uh, so second half of next year they plan to start producing a cheap EV. Um, so that's cool. Hope to see what that comes out. You didn't say anything else other than they're doing it. Is and you'll announce more on August. On the same platform as the 3Y. Sort of. It's a hybrid between the new platform and the current 3 and It'll be built on the same assembly line as yeah. the 3 and Y in the same factories. It'll so, probably be a similar sort of frame, but they're going to use yeah. a very full and who knows your architecture. So it'll I'm I'm eager to see what they come up with because like we need a twenty five thousand dollar EV and then that a whole argument disappears, right? We just need somebody to come out with a cheap new EV and then the massive threes can all die, right? Um, so we'll get there. Hopefully Tesla will do it this August. Watch this space. Um, Tesla laid off 10% of its workforce this month, and then Musk also is asking for a $56 billion raise this month, which is not a great look. Um, he got denied this compensation package um, because the court said no. Um, and it was it was an investor lawsuit that brought the court to say that. Um, and so now they're asking investors to reinstate it. So I don't know if that's going to work. Um, just to put this into perspective, if the $56 billion raise that Musk wants went to the workers they just laid off. Each worker would be paid $3.7 million each. All 3,878 Cybertrucks have been recalled to fix the accelerator pedal, which slides off and gets stuck underneath the firewall oh. and then makes them accelerate indefinitely. Uh, it's an easy fix, in fairness. It's a rivet. Um, it takes like a few minutes. It's just... If you, something to do with soap on that to make it slide on. Yeah, there's an unapproved Very assembly hard. practice or something. Um, so if you have a Cybertruck, you probably already know this, but if you don't know this for whatever reason, then go get your pedal fixed. Um, they'll come to you probably with a little rig. Just make sure that they slide the pedal down first before they rivet it, because I saw one picture where it was like half slid up and then they riveted. And it's like, well, that rivet's not going to hold because it's already halfway up with that. Anyway, yeah. All right, uh, so that's the end of the news. Nice and controversial, very fun. Um, if you are not a member, become a member. Membership fees are not that expensive. It's an annual fee and it helps us, you know, do events and stuff. Um, your first meeting is free, but otherwise we encourage you to join. Um, you can help volunteer with us. It pays for the insurance for the events basically is what it does and, you know, the website and all that. Um, so yeah, do that. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. I just took a new screenshot this month, so we have 91 followers. You guys are almost 100 people. One of them, like two of them are me, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you'd like to present at one of our meetings, we're always looking for ideas. Um, I found a nice link to go to slides, so more interesting. Um, just send your request or your idea to input Evco, and um, you know, we'll talk to you. We'll send you the template. You can come present the topic. Um, we'll slot you into one of the meetings. Um, yeah, we'll do that. And we're going to get ready to roundtable. But before we do the roundtable, I'm just going to sign off on the YouTube video. So if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you for watching. Um, we'll see you next month. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. Uh, for the rest of you, you guys can stick around. We'll put you guys up on the big screen. And you can like chime in. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. You just pipe in. And uh, yeah, time for the roundtable. 